Good afternoon, everyone. Um, first, I'd like to express my gratitude to Veronica for her leadership in putting these conversations together. Um, I'm just going to offer a few remarks to frame the conversations we will have today. In the summer of 1967, Martin Luther King's Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community was published. And in this text, Dr. King implored Americans to resist the idea that the nation was, quote, essentially hospitable to fair play and to the steady growth toward middle class utopia embodying racial harmony. King reflected, unfortunately, that is a fantasy of self-deception and comfortable vanity. Nearly 50 years to the moment that King began gathering his allies to mount the Poor People's Campaign in what would be the final year of his life, we gather today to consider the ways that inequality persists inside and outside of our institutions, in our classrooms, at the benches in our courtrooms, at the ballot box, and on the corridors of our main streets, to resist a desire to confuse the progress of some for the liberation of all. In the decades since King warned us that if we move deeper into chaos, we will never realize the fullness of community. We have seen an unprecedented shift in civil rights legislation, gains in educational attainment, wealth accumulation, and political power among populations historically disenfranchised, disempowered, and distanced from the courtroom, the classroom, the ballot box, and the main street. While these signs of progress were all around us, visible in media, in business, and even the White House, another force, perhaps a force greater than the sum total of all these outward signs of change. And that force was the machinery of inequality. The policies, the rhetoric, the practices that have left a critical mass of people behind and an almost as insidious mechanism that makes the most vulnerable in our society the most loathed, reviled, and hated. In 2017, our challenges are uniquely different than those of King in the last year of of his life. Yet as we see the assault on voting rights, on public education, on credit and lending, and in the delivery of justice and accountability, we realize that we cannot rely on the ill-fated notion that time heals all wounds. This is what King warned us of in his address in Washington, D.C., four days before his death. He urged Americans to resist what he called the myth of time. He wrote, it is the notion that only time can solve the problems of racial injustice. And there are those who often sincerely say to the Negro and his allies in the white community, why don't you slow up? Stop pushing things so fast. Only time can solve the problem. And if you will just be nice and patient and continue to pray, in 100 or 200 years, the problem will work itself out. King continued, this is another myth. It's that time is neutral. It can be used constructively or destructively. And I'm sorry to say this morning that I'm absolutely convinced that the forces of ill will in our nation, the extreme rightists of our nation, the people on the wrong side have used time much more effectively than the forces of goodwill. And it may well be that we will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the vitriolic words and the violent actions of the bad people, but for the appalling silence and indifference of the good people who sit around and say, wait on time. Somewhere we must see that human progress never rolls in on the wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless efforts and the persistent work of dedicated individuals. And without this hard work, time itself becomes an ally of the primitive forces of social stagnation. So we must help time and realize that the time is always ripe to do what is right. So today our conversation does not rest in the self-deception King tried to lead the country out of. Rather, these conversations are grounded in a sobering reality about where our nation stands today. Fragile but fortunate, precarious but powerful, because of the courageous leadership of the people we will talk to today. So my first conversation will be with New America Fellow, Nicole Hannah-Jones, about education. Hi, Nicole. Hey. Good to see you. You too, I just saw you a few minutes ago. I know, we had lunch. <laughs> um, so you have devoted, I think when we were talking, you said 13 years of your life to looking at this issue that I think many people believe they understand, but through your excellent award-winning reporting, you show us that we don't understand, and that is school segregation. 
So when you look at the narratives, the master narrative about what's happening at schools, what have we missed? So I think when it comes to school segregation, there's three myths that um, seem to persist. One is that we tried really hard to integrate and it was just too difficult and that's why we have segregated schools. It's actually not the truth. We didn't try that hard for that long and when we did try, um, we were able to make a great deal of headway. Um, the myth around that is also around that it was busing that destroyed our efforts to integrate schools. But uh, American children, as long as there have been school buses, have ridden buses to school. There's a reason why the school bus is the most iconic image of education. It's because kids always rode buses. And actually, for most of the history, uh, kids were riding buses in order to maintain segregation, and busing only became a problem when it was in order to integrate. But most places um, actually never bust for integration, though that is, that is the myth about that. And I think the third, have I named two? You've named two. Okay. The rule of three. <laughs> the third is that uh, we can somehow make separate equal now. That prior to Brown v. Board, yesterday was the 63rd anniversary of Brown v. Board. Prior to Brown v. Board, we have understood that separate was um, unconstitutional. But now we feel like because we don't have laws mandating segregation, that the segregation of black and brown children is somehow not as harmful, and that is somehow not as morally repugnant. And that's also not true. Um, if you look at the data collected by the US Department of Education, um, you can predict the quality of education that a student will receive by how black the school is to this day. And there's never been a moment in history where we have given black students the same resources as white. Part of something we were talking about, um, if you've read The Warmth of Other Suns, incredible book about the Great Migration, there's one story in it that I think really captures this moment in which an African-American man from the South goes to Chicago and he's seated at a bar and he orders a glass of whiskey and he's very happy he has this opportunity. And after he consumes the glass of whiskey, the bartender breaks the glass in front of him as a reminder of something that he has touched is no longer valuable and to essentially discipline him in the ways that we know racism does. And in many ways, what I, I perceive is happening is that our nation is breaking the whiskey glass. We're destroying it because it has been touched or there's been an attempt to touch it. And I think in many ways we see that with schools. One of the strategies to not integrate schools was just burn the school down or cancel the entire school year. And so what have been the mechanisms that have been outside of the laws that um, school districts have used to maintain segregation? So it's interesting because we are now at a time where the woman who is leading the Department of Education is someone who in many ways opposes the ideal of public schools. And what we know is that uh, support for public schools and other public institutions began to erode after the Civil Rights Movement when legally black people began to get access to the public for the first time. Um, and those two things are tied together. So eroding support in public schools occurs in communities where there are uh, diverse student populations. There are many, many ways that we accomplish this now. Um, school districts gerrymander attendance zones to make sure that white uh, parents have majority white schools to send their children to. We're now starting to see a lot of school districts trying to break off, um, or communities, white communities in urban areas trying to break off from predominantly black school districts so that they don't have to send their kids or even pay tax dollars to support children who they don't think are like them. Um, we're seeing the school choice movement, which a lot of communities have embraced, actually has its roots in resistance to desegregation. You never had school choice until um, courts started to order black children into white schools, and then we saw this rising of choice. Vouchers are the same thing. Uh, vouchers also came out of the resistance to school um, desegregation. In the South, the first time you start to see vouchers are when courts are ordering desegregation, and the vouchers are actually being paid for by the state to allow white children to attend segregation academies. So all of these things um, that 50 years ago and 60 years ago we understood were clearly to oppose uh, black and white children being in the same classroom together, we're seeing the same tactics, but now there's a veneer of respectability, and now we can pretend that it's not about race, but um, what, this, what the research shows is that the motivation is still race. 
It allows for a level of clean hands, and it seems like um, our new racial projects are about people not getting messy when they get involved in it. Um, one of the things that we were chatting with earlier was when we think about the problems of school desegregation and segregated schools, we often focus on the children, but we know that schools have to operate with a number of grown-ups in the building. And this leads me to this question about um, some of these statistics that we have a majority minority public school system in the United States and that in the 2011-2012 school year, 82% of teachers were white. And so we have this, or if that data is incorrect, you can tell well, me it's more. It's a little off. But it's a little off. Is it, is it too high or too low? Well, we don't, we don't have a, um, first I'm say I would never say minority or majority well, yeah, minority because yeah, um, I think that that gives people of color are permanent inferior status, and also numerically it's not possible. Um, but our school district, our, our overall public schools are actually about half and half. Right. Um, so we have not reached a point where students of color are largest, mm -hmm. but almost, we're almost there. And in that, in that process though, we do see declining numbers of teachers of color. Yes. And how do you think that the, the workforce in teaching and school administration can either exacerbate these problems or actually um, interfere with them? So this is actually one of the unintended consequences of Brown v. Board of Education. Prior to Brown v. Board, um, black teachers were the ones teaching black children. And as soon as uh, desegregation started, black teachers were not allowed to teach white children in white schools. And so those teachers were often laid off. Um, they were often fired. Black principals were fired. And it was black schools that were closed. Um, and we've never then recovered the number of black educators that we had at that time. And I think there are. There are severe consequences. I mean, there, were, there are numerous studies, including one that just came out last month, that showed that white teachers actually have much lower expectations for black children than they do for white children. And that then manifests itself in the achievement gap that we see, where even if black children are getting access to integrated classrooms, their teachers are still not believing that they actually can achieve at the same levels of black students. Um, I think it shows up in the curriculum. I think it shows up in um, how teachers are teaching history, how they're teaching English. Um, it, it shows up across the spectrum and I think is very problematic. It's also problematic because a lot of teachers are teaching children they actually have no experience with. They're teaching children from communities that they don't have experience with. Um, and that has also led to high suspension rates, um, high expulsion rates, and much harsher discipline in the classroom. Uh, one recent study showed that if a black child, particularly a black boy, has one black teacher in his life, he has a much higher chance of graduating. That's very powerful. Um, and it's amazing how many black students never have a black teacher. But also importantly, it shows that children of all races actually prefer to have teachers of color and actually do better with teachers of color, amazingly. And when you think about the research that you've done and the reporting you've done, and now that you're working on a book project, um, so I think I want to kind of close with this question of audience um, because there's a serious assumptions about this type of work is meant to talk to some people and not others. But what, at the end of the day, um, do you want um, the audience to imagine after they read your book? That's, uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I think lately when I've been giving my talks, the first thing that I do is I show pictures of, of children and these children are black children in segregated schools. Because I think while adults are fighting about what politically is acceptable and whether we should and can um, integrate schools and give black children their constitutional right to an equal education, we're forgetting that we're all fighting over kids. We're fighting over keeping some kids away from other kids. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is the most critical thing is these are American children. These are our children. But we don't all think of them as our children. Um, I think I was telling you earlier, one of the, the questions that I get sometimes when I give talks, and I almost always I'm giving talks in front of very white, very progressive audiences, and what people say to me is, um, how do we get the people who really need to be here in the room? Like conservatives. But I'm not actually writing to conservatives because, frankly, conservatives are not the problem. Uh, the problem are uh, white progressive people who say they believe in equality, who say that they believe in integration, but they choose something very different when it comes to their communities. If I could just get people who actually believe in integration to live lives of integration, I will have succeeded without ever having to like, convince someone who is opposed to integration to change their minds. And I think that is a thing that we need to get over. Um, 
I live in New York City, can't get more progressive than that. I live in a city where the mayor ran for election on the tail of two cities and who refuses to touch the issue of school segregation in the most segregated uh, large school district in the country. So that is my audience. My audience are people who say they believe that this is the right thing, but do the wrong thing. Well, this, I said that was gonna be the last question, but one more <laughs> second. Um, so schooling um, really rests at that perfect storm of the intersection of personal choice and structural inequality. And so when we think about the kind of questions that people ask you in the hallway after you give the lecture, um, what are the ways that we can, that your research and your storytelling can help us understand that those two things are not as disparate as we imagine? Uh, the problem is choice is based on the system of capitalism. Right, Amen. which is the market. Schools are the market. And as we know, when, when there is a market, there will be winners and losers. Some people will get access to something great and other people won't. I think what my work is trying to do is not make the argument for choice. One cannot at the same time say, I want equality for all children, but I also need an advantage for my own child. Those views are actually antithetical to each Can other. Can you say that one more time for the people <laughs> in the back? <laughs> I mean, and I get it, I'm a parent. Your instinct is to try to get the very best for your child, but if you're going to do that, you have to understand that that is in a, um, where we have limited resources, that is coming at the cost of someone else's child. Someone else's child who is already disadvantaged in every way. Um, we are a capitalist country, and I believe if you pay for schools, you can get what you pay for. But if we are proudly promoting our belief in public schools, there should not be some public schools that are offering lavish luxury education to some kids and other public schools, like the ones I just got back from visiting in Detroit, where they don't even have enough seats and where kids don't have textbooks, right? Like this is, this is the system that we are holding up. So if you believe in the public part of public schools, then it means that your child's gonna get the same education that another child get. The reason that integration is so important is not because magically black kids become smart when they sit next to white kids. What they get is what white kids get. On that note, I want to thank you not only for this conversation, um, but I also, I also want to thank you for your, your, your commitment that this isn't a story you did once and it was kind of cool, but this is really a sustained effort that takes a lot out of you personally, but also um, helps us uh, make better choices and be better people. So thank you for that. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, well, uh, like we will try to uh, recreate the situation that you all just uh, were privy to and try to have a meaningful conversation here. So thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, I guess I should say that I upfront should acknowledge that I'm a huge fan of your work. So <laughs> I, I want to maybe start by, I think, in the same way that um, the previous people in these chairs started by discussing the ways in which we talk about the issue. I wanna talk a little about the ways in which we talk about inequality and the growth of inequality right now. I wonder if you could identify for me what you see as, I guess, sort of the uh, large sort of myths or uh, themes that you find problematic that are often repeated. So some of the large myths and themes that are widespread and often repeated are pretty much the politics of responsibility. Uh, the notions of if you do this, you do that, you will be fine and there are opportunities in America. Uh, probably the primary indicator to dispel some of that mythology is also the primary indicator of one's life chances and that would be wealth. Uh, if we know for instance, uh, my work with various colleagues that when you look at black individuals where the head of household graduated from college, the net wealth position is gonna be less than that for a comparable white family where the head dropped out of high school. So that's telling, that, right? If, if we know all the things that wealth brings about to people, if you're confronted with uh, crises in your home, if you have to you know, it pay for an expensive medical bill and you don't have health insurance, if you want to finance an elite education, I can think of any number of things. If you want to have political influence, 
a primary determinant of that would be net wealth or net worth, wealth. And yet, we know that black households, when we talk about a middle class, there virtually is none when we talk about wealth. There is no black middle class. That's, that, that's the reality we're in. So that the rhetoric around responsibility can be, I can, I'm going to not go ramble on too much, but the rhetoric around responsibility, not only is it fictive and not true, but it's also harmful. It's harmful because it removes public responsibility from addressing these structural issues. If the issues are um, engaging in the right behaviors, then the argument against, the argument for austerity policies are, why give resources to areas in which they won't have return? And then the second thing is, you know, even, even worse is, why incentivize bad behaviors with resources? So that's what comes about from the politics of responsibility. But, you know, that's not the reality we're in, so. Well, I, I, I wonder, given that, um, what you make of the uh, intense, and it seems very uh, large interest that exists right now in uh, growing inequality in white America, and uh, the very real challenges that many working class white Americans are facing in really participating in the new economy. I wonder if you think that is in some way advancing the inequality conversation? Is it moving us out of the um, personal responsibility mm -hmm. sort of narrative or is something else happening? Yeah, I mean the narrative is hypocritical to begin with, right? We, when we characterize white family struggle, we don't usually come up with the notions of you don't work hard, you're not playing by the rules, et cetera, et cetera. It becomes the economy has left you behind. It becomes outsourcing, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, merit and facts don't necessarily support the arguments. But, you know, this election can inform us a lot about what's going on with regards to narratives. Um, and, I, and let me re really even emphasize this. We know what to do about inequality. We know what to do about, about poverty. We're not short on policies. I can think of some bold policies to address these issues. The issues become narrative and political. Do we have the will to, to, check, to uh, come up with a society that really empowers people so that they can be self-determining in achieving their goals? That, right? I think we can do that. Um, but, but going back to this election, when people say that the results were a mandate with regards to class, it doesn't seem to follow with regards to how people voted. Um, the demographic income group for which Hillary got the most, Hillary, uh, Secretary Hillary Clinton got the most support was the low income group. Now, of course, that is the group for which you might have the most diversity in our country, but nonetheless, if you move up the income scale, that is where Trump started to uh, main, uh, uh, get a lead, et cetera. So um, what this election was about, codifying the property rights and whiteness. Trump ran on that message, so despite how the journalists might characterize the results of the election, his messages of make America great again, his message of here's one that didn't get a lot of attention, but thinking about the demographic change that has that uh, been projected to, a com to come where whites will no longer be the numerical majority, Trump said literally, I am your last chance. So what was he appealing to? He was appealing to this codification of whiteness so that their relative positioning would, would not worsen uh, given the demographic change that's, that's pending. Could you explain in just a little more detail what you mean by the property whites, rights of whiteness and uh, working to limit the slide of white Americans with respect to other groups of Americans, what do you mean by that specifically? Right, so we care about our absolute positioning, but we also care about our relative positioning. And I think that goes underemphasized. We not only care about material being, our well-being, but we care about our psychological well-being. So there are real psychological benefits as well as material benefits associated with group membership and group identity. And we need to realize that. I mean, especially when we start talking about coalition building. If we're talking about coalition building, we need to be honest. Uh, and frankly, the question of would white working class individuals be better off from a coalition with other identity groups 
it's somewhat of an empirical question. I know the way I'd like the answer to be, but if I'm honest, uh, throughout history, white people have benefited at the expense of others. And to ignore that narrative does a disservice to history, and it also leads us into a realm of, of delusion. Um, but, you know, what, what, so let's think of some tangible things. The unemployment rate at every level of education is two to one for blacks compared to whites. Um, we know that infant mortality, black women with a college degree, are more likely to have an infant mortality or de deliver yeah, an infant mortality in comparison to white women who've dropped out of high school. So, um, you know, these are hard facts to deal with, but the reality is there are tangible benefits associated with being white. I can talk about other ones as well. Um, so those are real material consequences, but also relative positioning. We, we, as human beings, we care about where we relatively stand. And um, the promise of I'm not at the low end, but I, I, have, I might be at the middle, at least I'm not as bad as those other individuals, well, well that, that matters to people. Um, so I don't want to give a complete pessimistic view I think that uh, and what we can do as a society is evolve to this position where we recognize that how we define economic well-being, economic health, is not solely determined on growth. It's not solely determined on GDP per capita, but rather, I like Amartya Sen, the Nobel laureate, when he talks about we need to come up with defining development in terms of human capabilities. And the way I would interpret that is allowing people, and truly empowering people with the agency to be self-defining and self-determining in, their, in, their, in their, their goals and what they want to achieve. And again, there are lots of policies that we can do to give people a base so that we say as a society, we're going to give you these resources so that you can achieve your higher goals and we're going to provide a baseline by which you will not be prey to the market or prey to other forces that might be predatory. Well, since you've mentioned the word policy a few times and we're in this room, I will go ahead and ask you about those uh, bold ideas, but I wonder if you could perhaps share with this audience your boldest ideas that you think would also begin to address something that you mentioned, this idea that wealth is actually effectively being transferred in the direction of white Americans every day. That's right. Um, so, uh, reparations, that's, that's the most obvious one we can do, and people talk about the political moment, can we achieve it, et cetera. Uh, there were points in South, South Africa's history where post-apartheid was unattainable, unfeasible, politically not, not plausible, but reparations first and foremost, in large part because of the dignity that a harm was committed against an individual, the recognition that we need redress, so it's not only substantive, but it has significant meaning as well. But then when people say, okay, that politically is not plausible, et cetera, et cetera, um, we can use what, what uh, Richard Reeves and Elizabeth Sawhill at uh, the Brookings Institute have coined the term race-conscious universal policies. And there's several of them that we can think about. For example, my colleague William Darity and I have talked about baby bonds. It's not technically a bond, it's a trust set up at birth so that individuals, when they become a young adult, they can have access to some resource or seed capital so that they can purchase an asset that will appreciate over their life positive, passively and provide them that economic security. So imagine as a young adult, we know that some individuals, because of the links of the family in which they're born into, will get some form of a transfer to allow them to get a down payment on a home, to allow them seed capital to start a business, whereas other individuals will have family obligations out of altruistic motive to help their family members. So we want to come up with a, I think we should have a society that frees individuals from the birth, the family in which they're born in, in a positive way so that they have an opportunity to accumulate economic security over their lifetime. I'll give one more, yeah. uh, uh, a federal job guarantee. Um, that's not pie in the sky. We can think of productive work that is not being done by the private sector, that really needs to be done, um, that are associated with infrastructure building in both the physical and human infrastructure. We can formalize care work that women are doing already 
with the dignity of a, of a, of a wage and benefits associated with that. Um, and I, again, I, we can think of all other types of work that can be done, but the federal job guarantee not only provides individuals who want a job, a actual job with livable wage, but it also enables current workers by getting rid of the threat of unemployment. It is that threat of unemployment that is the biggest constraint on labor bargaining powers. So if we really want a, a capitalist system where there's, fear, where there's fair trade between workers and, and owners of firm, then we need to empower workers so that they're not destitute by a threat of, we'll take something away from you. I think we're out of time, oh. <laughs> but I have plenty more that I could ask. So, but I appreciate it, um, and thank you for your time. That thank was you. fascinating. <laughs>
what sentence recommendations they're going to make. And when you look at the disproportionate impact that it's had on communities of color, you have to consider the fact that 95% of the prosecutors in this country are white, 79% of the prosecutors in this country are white men, and as a woman of color, I represent 1% of all elected prosecutors in this country. So representation is extremely, extremely important. And I believe that prosecutors are probably the most important actor in the criminal justice system. They are going to make a determination as to whether or not an individual will even get into the system or they will be diverted from the system. You know, one of the things that I've tried to instill in my prosecutors, not only in recruiting and retaining a diverse sort of group of prosecutors, all with a moral who come from these backgrounds and have life experiences that will allow them to utilize their discretion in, in ways that address these systemic issues, but really trying to instill upon them that it's not just about seeking convictions. You as a prosecutor, you are uh, uh, the administer of justice. And so that's something that we try to instill through, you know, the training of prosecutors. We prosecute 50,000 cases a year in Baltimore City, realizing and instilling in our prosecutors that it's not just a number. You know, in their training, they go into the jails and, you know, they see the collateral sort of consequences of their individualized um, decisions. Right. So if you were governor or, or a president and, and you or the attorney general at Department of Justice, what, what would, and you had to, uh, just a laundry list of items for criminal justice reform, what would you prioritize to try to get rid of some of the disparities? What changes would you like to see? So first and foremost, we cannot um, afford to regress, right? We can't afford to um, regress and that regression cannot be touted as making America great again. We cannot allow that to happen. And what we need to understand is that all of that sort of um, the mobilization for criminal justice reform mm -hmm. is going to come from a local level. Like, it's not going to be on the federal level. We see where the attorney, our attorney general is trying to take us. The failed policies of the past, which got us in the positions where we saw uprisings all across the, all across the nation. Um, so first and foremost, I would say that we collectively need to ensure that we're supporting local officials, local prosecutors, making criminal justice reform a number one priority, not being distracted by the tweets and you know the antics of, 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 of the White House. Um, I think that we have to stay focused. Um, and one of the things that we can do is a representation, because there is an underrepresentation in law and in the criminal justice field. I think that we need to still prioritize when it comes to addressing prosecution from a holistic sort of approach, not just being tough on crime. We can be tough on crime for the most violent offenders, individuals with no code of ethics, killing women and killing children, but we need to be smart on crime. What does that mean? We need to understand that when we talk about these felony convictions, when young people between the ages of 18 and 24 get these felony convictions, they can no longer apply for a job, they can no longer apply for housing, they can't go back to school because they can't get any financial aid, and so what other recourse do they have but to go out doing what they were doing in the first place? We have several sort of initiatives, at least out of my office, where it's, it's modeled after Senator Kamala Harris's Back on Track program, aimed to be more. For first time, nonviolent felony drug offenders, they go through a probationary period where they learn life skills, they learn job training skills, they do community service, and at the end of that probationary period, they're given a job and their felony records are wiped clean. We need to expand those sorts of initiatives and make Make people understand that it's not just the state attorney's office or the DA's office or the police. We can't police our way out of this, right? Everybody has a stake in the outcome of our communities. And it's time for us to have developed public-private partnerships to ensure that we are addressing those systemic issues. Yeah, and so, and I mean, so if change comes from the grassroots level, from the local, from, from basically bottom up, um, and but only 1% of elected <laughs> state's attorneys look like you, then what, what, is, what is the way of getting more representation into the courtrooms and into, into the, uh, the legal profession? So uh, again, it, under representation in, in law and in any sort of profession, not just law, that maintains the status quo, right? right? Like we have to be able to organize, strategize, and implement. Systemic reform comes from within. It's only when you have a seat at the table that you're able to address the issues within you know, structures and systems. And so, I'll just utilize, you know, me being in this position. 
You know, we had, and, and, and a lot of folks know me for the Freddie Gray case, but there was accountability that had been had across the board, right? You know, we're applying justice fairly and equally to everybody, regardless of your occupation. That, despite the backlash, the, the accountability then led to exposure, right? Like exposure. We had a Department of Justice report that, that showed the discriminatory policing practices of one of the largest agencies in the country. Right. That exposure then led to reform, and even despite the fact that the, the the federal administration tried to forestall the consent decree. It's now signed, and it's, it's in place, and the discriminatory policing practices of one of the largest agencies in the country is no more. So you have to address this, but that systemic reform comes from within, and we need to understand that so that we have a seat at the table. Right, so, uh, and so I would love for you to share just how you got into this profession. Uh, again, because if change is coming from the local level, um, then there are young black women looking at you today who will be you um, 10 times over in, in 10 cities around the country, or you know, in hopefully many more. Um, but you are sort of uh, one of the kindlings that will sort of start the flame. And one of the things we do here at New America is we tell the stories to, so that the policies will make sense uh, and, and, that, and it's accessible to everyone. So your story, I think, and your path to law is, is a way to, to sort of... So absolutely, and I think it's already happening, right? We now understand the importance of this position as uh, these local races, these local DA races. We saw it in Chicago with Kim Fox. Mm -hmm. We saw it in Orlando with Aramis Ayala. We saw it, you know, with Kim Gardner. Um, in, in, in St. Louis. So it's, we understand the importance of that, right? And, and a lot of those were after the fact, after the Freddie Gray case, they right. came and these were elections. We are now understanding not just Freddie Gray, but Ferguson, the importance of that role. For me, um, I took a different sort of path. When I was about 14 years old, it was a tragedy that spawned my passion. Um, I come from five generations of police officers. My great grandfather, my great uncle, and my grandfather was one of the founding members of the first black police organization in Massachusetts. Our house, he was the ideal sort of community police officer. So our house was known as the police house, right? We would have constantly children, the troubled children coming to our house. And you'd come in and you wouldn't even know anybody. I'm like, hey, yeah, all right. Um, but I look back and it was, he, was, he was a role model, not just for my community, or, I mean, not just for me individually, but for my community. Right. And so that was instilled in me. But when my cousin, when I was 14, my cousin was killed right outside of our home in broad daylight, and he was mistaken as a neighborhood drug dealer. Mm -hmm. He was really an honor student, had aspirations of becoming an architect, and if it wasn't for a neighbor who cooperated with police and testified in court, my family wouldn't have received any sort of justice. Mm -hmm. This was my first introduction to the criminal justice system. I had gone to the police station with my mom and my dad, but I had never gone into court, and having to see the autopsy photos and seeing my cousin with all these dreams and all these aspirations, who's now going to a grave, but at 14, what was more perplexing to me was the fact that the individual responsible for his death was also 17 years old and I was really perplexed because I couldn't understand why the community was so complacent, right? Why we as a community have become so complacent with seeing so many young black men laying de dead in the streets. That's an image that to this very day is branded in my mind. And going into the courthouse and seeing the number of African Americans coming in and out of the, the courthouse in chains and shackles at 14, I said, well, what is this system? And, and, and why is it the way that it is? And how do we reform it? So that's what spawned my passion. And I ultimately decided to become a prosecutor because I felt that was the best way to be able to reform the criminal justice system. Right. Um, and <clears throat> we're almost out of time, but could you talk a little bit about, okay, so, you know, you, your path led you there. Um, you went through all of the, of the you know, law school, and, and uh, you worked um, uh, at for an insurance company for a little while. And, yeah, and, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you've sort of seen it from all kinds of angles. How are you received by judges, by by um, you know, prosecuting attorneys <laughs> or defending attorneys, you know? Well, what I've learned, you know, I've been in office for two years and five months. It feels like 25 years. <laughs> but um, what I've learned is not to um, internalize things, right? Like, you know, the same way that um, I said that I represent 1% of all elected women of color in the country as prosecutor. You know, it's, it's not about me individually, it's about what I represent. So a lot of the backlash, like when I first beat an incumbent that outraised me four to one by double digit percentage points and became the state's attorney, you know, the media um, is, was very 
not friendly, right? They said, one of the, the commentators said that the, the position should be appointed. And then for the first two weeks when I was in office, they wrote several stories about how my husband was running my office, right? You have the misogynistic undertones and the racist undertones. There was a time when there was a homicide review commission that they accused me of personally of derailing, even though I, as well as the current commissioner, didn't agree. Um, and for several articles, not only did they file, follow the derailment article up with it, they wrote an editorial that said, play nice, Miss Mosby. And then after that, the NPR affiliate piled on and said, called me scornful for not being on the same page as the police department, even though we were. And when it came out that the police commissioner was on the same page, it, it, it was, everybody was quiet. So, you know, although the newest crop of delegates, which are mostly young men, aren't referred in the media as being scornful or, you know, it's just something that comes with the territory. And, you know, I also, I, I, I appreciate the fact that the negativity is also something that is, you know, I, I, I don't internalize. Right. And it, it's more about, we, I just, I get as much positivity from the community as well. Right, very good. Well, we're just about out of time, um, but thank you so much for, for uh, joining us today and, and we'll be back for, for questions uh, from the audience. Thank you. Well, if you all haven't heard enough from me, um, get ready for some more long-winded questions. But um, <laughs> thank you very much for joining us today. And I wanted to, I think, um, try to start with a very, very, very basic question. But I think that in certainly the last election cycle, but truly dating back a few election cycles now, there's been a great deal of conversation, energy, focus, legislation, litigation around the fundamental concept that voter fraud is a scourge on the American electoral process that must be constrained and destroyed. Um, and at the same time, very little in the way of sort of collective action on actual access to the ballot and uh, uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. So I wonder if you could talk a bit about that and why also we seem to have this very imbalanced way of thinking about voting. Right. So a uh, very important question. And I think um, at the outset, it's important to note that the right to vote is the most important civil right in our democracy. And you know, this past Friday, the president launched a so-called election integrity uh, commission. Uh, this is a sham commission that is purportedly uh, off to now search for and find evidence of widespread vote fraud across our country. And we know that they're not gonna turn anything up because vote fraud doesn't exist. Um, there is a study that's been issued by the Brennan Center a partner organization that finds that vote fraud in our country happens at a rate of about 0.0003%. Um, but what we do know is that voter suppression is alive and well across our country, that voting discrimination is real, that states like Texas have taken steps to block access to the ballot box with uh, restrictive and unnecessary rules uh, their photo ID law, which we have been fighting for almost four years now, is perhaps one of the most uh, crude and restrictive voter suppression measures that we've seen in modern time. Um, this is a law, Texas's photo ID law, uh, is one that allows you to vote if you have a passport, a driver's license. A lot of people have those forms of ID. Uh, a conceal and carry permit qualifies, but a student college ID does not. Or a hunting license. That's right. <clears throat> and we know that these laws are about picking off people at the margins, people who are poor, uh, people who rely on public transportation and so they don't drive and don't have a driver's license, people who've never been on a plane. And um, to me, democracy is broken unless everyone is able to participate and have their voice heard. Um, so I'm angered uh, by this election integrity commission that has been launched. It's a waste of taxpayer dollars. It is noise and distraction um, designed to turn us away from the real issues 
that threaten our democracy, and uh, we know that voter suppression is, is one of them. I think um, certainly voter ID is a, a concept I would imagine that most people in this room are somewhat familiar with, as well as the idea that uh, it affects different groups differently in terms of their access to the ballot. But there are perhaps two things that get a little less attention, which is uh, the fact that in some states, if you've been convicted of um, certain crimes or certainly felonies, you can lose your right to vote permanently or be in a position where you have to take some very affirmative and extensive steps to regain that right. Um, in addition to that, uh, there have been, as I understand it, a wave of polling place closures around the country, which literally mean that people have to wait for longer periods of time to vote. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the, what is known about the uh, real effect that both of those things, or perhaps one at a time, have had on voter participation, perhaps in 2016. You know, very few people talk about felon disenfranchisement statutes, which are uh, a real uh, barrier to the ballot. Uh, there are about 8 million American citizens who can't vote today because of a conviction on their record. And because of the racial disparities that infect our criminal justice system, these laws have a greater burden on the voting rights of African Americans and Latinos and other minority communities. And these laws came about during the Jim Crow era. It was clear um, that these were laws that states put on the books because they were specifically seeking to exclude African Americans from access to the ballot box. To me, it's shameful in 2017 that these laws still exist today. Um, there are two states in our country, actually, that when you, when you take race out of the equation, uh, people actually get it. So Vermont and Maine, for example, are two states where you can vote even when you're in jail. Mm -hmm. um, but once you put race into the equation, this has been another dirty tactic that states have resorted to, to lock certain Americans out of the ballot box. Um, Florida is actually one of the worst examples. Um, about 25% of African American men can't vote because of a criminal conviction. Uh, on their record, and there's actually a ballot initiative that will go before voters in 2018 that will give the electorate that can vote uh, the, the, the opportunity to correct this injustice. Um, but uh, to me, it's shameful uh, that this idea that once people have paid their debt to society, that we would still deny them um, the most core right uh, in American citizenship, the right to vote. Um, I believe that once people have paid their debt to society, they deserve a second chance and deserve access to a job and to housing and deserve access to the ballot box. Um, perhaps I should go off script just a bit here and ask you to explain the relationship between that felony conviction issue and uh, access to housing, jobs, education. Um, there is an obvious relationship between all of those things and the ability to vote and shape our country, but I wonder if you could talk a little more about that. Yeah, barriers to reentry for returning citizens, people with criminal histories, you know, sadly is real. Uh, all across our country, you have employers who just feel like, you know, that person who, with that 10-year-old conviction is not somebody that they can have in the workplace. Uh, landlords, same thing. This is somebody who's going to be a threat. Uh, to the community if we let them in. How on earth do we give people an opportunity to uh, really bounce back and get back on their feet if we're not giving them the tools and resources that they need to successfully reintegrate into their communities? Um, a huge issue, and you know, it's one that even rears its head in the context of educational opportunity. Mm -hmm. There are colleges and universities across our country, for example, that ask student applicants to disclose not just whether they've got a conviction on their record, but whether or not they've ever been stopped by the police or arrested by the police. Um, we treat people with criminal histories as if they bear a scarlet letter. Uh, another huge crisis that we really need to work to address. But I, I think the, the right to vote is central. American citizens deserve the right to vote, period, point blank. Mm -hmm. 
So I guess then it, 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 we've come to a moment where it seems like a natural question is to talk a little about um, what you see as the major pieces of litigation and perhaps legislation on the horizon um, that perhaps you or other, uh, I guess, members of, I know you're part of a larger coalition of voting rights organizations. What's on the horizon that people are really watching closely and deeply concerned about? Yeah, voter suppression is front and center. And, you know, a lot of people tend to pay attention to elections every four years and presidential election years. But we know from being in the trenches that officials are working around the clock across our country to try and make access to the ballot box more difficult. Um, so let me tell you about some of what we're, we're fighting. Um, we just won a victory in the state of Georgia. Um, there's a congressional uh, special election for the 6th District in Georgia. And Georgia imposed a 90-day registration deadline for people who want to vote in the runoff um, that's scheduled to happen in June. Federal law is clear. Um, for federal elections in our country, you can't impose more than a 30-day deadline. Um, and Georgia decided to just put a footnote on that and say, no, we're going to make it 90 days for runoff races. So we sued and we won, and people in Georgia can actually register through May 21st if they want to vote in that upcoming 6th District runoff race. We're fighting things like vote purging. Um, you have some counties that claim that they're cleaning up the registration rolls and they're actually taking steps to strip legitimately registered voters from the rolls. So um, that's something that we're watching out for. And we're also gearing up for the next round of redistricting. Gerrymandering is a problem in our country. Uh, we just filed a lawsuit dealing with racial gerrymandering in the state of Georgia. And we need uh, folks to start to gear up to prepare for the 2020 round of redistricting because we want redistricting maps that fairly reflect um, the racial makeup and partisan makeup of communities. Um, so threats to democracy happen 365 days a year and every um, year during a decade. And um, we're out there encouraging people to be vigilant and encouraging people to turn out and participate in local elections, which is also critically important to the health of our democracy. Um, Sherilyn Mosby was just here. Mm -hmm. uh, so many people are talking about fixing our criminal justice system. We need more diversity among the ranks of um, DAs across our country. DAs have so much power um, and have the ability to decide what happens when police shootings happen in their communities. So through the ballot box, we have the ability to achieve a great deal of reform if we embrace that power. I, I feel as if we would be deeply remiss if we didn't speak about uh, the Justice Department and what it means to fight for voting rights under the Trump administration in the absence of Section 5 of the, of the Voting Rights Act. Um, I wonder if we perhaps could talk a little bit about what that means, both in terms of your sheer workload um, and stress level but also what is it that you worry most perhaps could slip through the cracks? So this Justice Department, this Saturday actually marks 100 days of Jeff Sessions occupying the role of Attorney General uh, in our country. And um, it's been a bitter uh, 90, 96, 97 days. I mean, uh, we knew that Jeff Sessions was bringing with him a record of great hostility uh, when it comes to civil rights, and he's made that clear virtually every day since he's been in that role. Um, we're seeing rollbacks not only with respect to voting rights, but also with respect to policing reform. Um, it was remarkable to see the Justice Department step in at the 11th hour, uh, seeking to undermine a carefully negotiated consent decree that would have put the city on a path to reform. Um, we know that we've got to uh, keep our foot on the gas and continue to bring pressure to bear on this attorney general to do his job. But the reality is that he is doing things that are harmful to our democracy. 
restoring the use of private prisons for federal inmates, um, uh, delaying uh, federal civil rights cases, uh, reversing position in critical civil rights cases. I mentioned the Texas voter ID case. That's a case that the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law and other partners have been fighting for four years. And we've been fighting shoulder to shoulder with the Justice Department. And uh, we were heading down to Texas about a month and a half ago for a critically important hearing. And literally, while bags were in hand and lawyers were getting ready to board flights, we got a call from the Justice Department saying that they were abandoning their position that the Texas photo ID law was adopted with a discriminatory purpose. And so we soldiered on without them after getting that 11th hour call, but um, it's clear that the courts are gonna be a really important place to safeguard civil rights and that we've gotta use our voice to push back and speak up when we see the government taking action that unravels all of the progress that had been put in place over the last several years. You mentioned when we were back in the green room the sense that uh, one has to play whack-a-mole in the absence of Section 5. I wonder if you could explain what that means and how that falls short of what could be accomplished when Section 5 was in place. So the Voting Rights Act of 1965 is our nation's most important federal civil rights law. The heart of that act is the Section 5 preclearance provision. This was a provision that required that states like Texas and North Carolina and Georgia and other states with long histories of voting discrimination. It said that before you can put in place a new law, like a photo ID law, you've got to submit that law for federal review so that we could be sure it would not be a law that would discriminate against minority voters. During the time the law was in place, it had blocked hundreds of discriminatory voting changes. Supreme Court issued a ruling in 2013 that gut that provision of the act, and since that time, we've seen the floodgates open, and we've seen states like Texas and North Carolina and Georgia kind of racing to the bottom when it comes to uh, voter suppression. North Carolina, this is the belly of the beast. Um, the Supreme Court just left in place a Fourth Circuit ruling finding that that state's voter suppression law um, discriminated against minority voters with almost surgical precision. The Supreme Court said, we're not going to review the case. And that was a victory because it left that Fourth Circuit decision intact. But now we are hearing that lawmakers in North Carolina, as we sit here, are uh, planning to renew the law and put a new mirror law on the books. So this is a game of whack-a-mole. Um, to me, it's shameful that lawmakers uh, would even think to do something like this. And for the civil rights lawyers, it means that we've got to roll up our sleeves and prepare for another fight that could go on for several years. Mm -hmm. But while that fight is going on, voters suffer. Mm -hmm. The voters who are impacted uh, and who are locked out of the ballot box are the ones who suffer. So it is a game of whack-a-mole, but um, we're focused on the important work that needs to be done to safeguard access to our democracy. I think we'll stop there, but um, I have been asked to ask for a little patience while we bring out the rest of the panel, and then I'm pretty sure that people have some questions for you, as well as other members of our panel. I know I have a few more questions, so um, if you all will just bear with us. <clears throat> <laughs>
Hello? So <laughs> you, you were mentioning in your statement that two places, just regardless of race right now, that get it right were Vermont and Maine. And I was wondering what your thoughts on why you think, if the reason that, if that the, the fact that Maine and Vermont are both the whitest states in this country at 95 and 96 percent white population has anything to do with that progressive nature on voting. Um, and then for Marilyn Mosby, I was wondering, we were, the conversation came up about how do you get representation in law? How do you get young black women to want to be, you know, prosecutors and judges and uh, a activists, I mean, advocates in, the, in that regard? And I was wondering, do you think that your experience in Baltimore and the way that you kind of got blackballed after approaching or investigating police officers deters black people from wanting to even get in that position, especially if the people who you are supposed to be, who are supposed to be your coworkers, your supporters, will turn against you once you are no longer on their side or supporting them blindly, as they say. And, uh, Thank you, so the question about voting? So you answered your own question. Absolutely the fact that these are two states <laughs> that are the whitest states in the country um, has something to do with the fact that uh, these are places that do not strip away the right to vote from people um, with criminal histories. In fact, they let people in jail vote. Um, so what race complicates things, right? And I think that's the theme of the story. Race comp has complicated things for decades and continues until this day to complicate things. Um, but these are laws that when you dig into the legislative history, it is so clear that lawmakers put these laws on the books to deny African Americans access to the ballot box. And um, it's shameful that we live with these laws on the books in many states today. Six million Americans denied the right to vote uh, because of felon disenfranchisement statutes. So um, I would say, yeah, it's, it's difficult being in this position and having the un underrepresentation in this field. Um, but what I think is helpful um, I can remember right after I won the primary, Democratic primary, I was in the community, right? Um, and this little eight-year-old girl walked up to me and she said, Marilyn Mosby, I voted for you. <laughs> 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 and I have an eight-year-old girl, little girl. So, you know, it really hit me, the, the, the sort of, the impact of that election. Because here you have a little girl who clearly didn't vote, but somebody had explained the importance of that fundamental right to her and she could see herself in me, right? So a lot of times what it takes is just that representation. And I can tell you because I have a relationship with Aramis Ayala and Kim Fox and Kim Gardner, we, we stay in constant communication, but they were inspired once they saw me in this position and they said, hey, I can do that too. You know, it, it's like you just need to, um, and this is one of the things I have gone to over, I've been in office for two years. I have done over a thousand community events, churches, and schools. I am in schools constantly because it's really important for you to instill in our young people that they can do and they can be anything that they want to be. And the same way that I get the kind of backlash from, you know, the conservative media, um, I get a whole lot of love from a whole lot of little girls who now understand that they can be state's attorney regardless of what the media does to me. So I think it's greater than me individually, and once you understand that, then you can, you, I'm gonna do my job and you know, hope that folks will understand the importance of this role. Thank you. Yes, in the green. <laughs> Thanks. I'm curious about how to bring this conversation or place this conversation in the digital age, especially on the justice in the courtroom conversation. There's experimentation with algorithms and sentencing. Proponents think it's great because it can take away certain kinds of bias. Uh, detractors think that uh, it can bake in bias if the indicators that you're using are already racially biased or whether it's technology that would help make electronic monitoring when you're on home arrest a slightly more dignified experience. Um, I can think of sort of ways in which the digital age touches all of these conversations and I'm curious, especially on the courtroom side, how you're thinking about that in your work, but on anybody <laughs> else, I'd love to hear that. Well, I can say um, with reference to the bail issue, one of the things that we've done in my office under this administration is we've increased the grant funding by more than 27%. We received um, more than $425,000 for a, um, what's called a smart prosecution grant. 
And we are essentially going in and we're working with pretrial um, to develop a metrics or a system for um, making recommendations on bail. We don't want to make these arbitrary sort of bail recommendations any longer. And so we're in the process of, you know, we have a researcher, we're gathering all of this information so that we no longer do that. That's just one example of, of some of the things that we're doing um, around that issue. Um, and, and again, bringing in IT, bringing in researchers, and, and utilizing the resources that are, are at our disposal. Um, Can I make one point? I, it's something that Nicole said earlier brought this to mind for me, which is that there, we have to be thoughtful about the way in which capitalism as an impulse or instinct can change things. And I can tell you that while this is probably not as welcome of an answer, there are definitely ways in which technology is being used uh, to enhance inequality in the justice system mm -hmm. right now as well. Just one minor example are obligations to, for instance, those who have been uh, convicted of drunk driving who are forced to attach these devices in some states to their vehicles that they have to blow into like a breathalyzer before your car will start. And you must pay for that system, for the installation. Companies bid for those contracts. They are not awarded based on how much it will cost the customer, but rather how much the company will pay the county. Um, the list goes on and on. Dignity is not part of that process, but um, just to be clear, I think there are lots of ways in which technology can also be certainly a knife edge. <laughs> so Eduardo Bonilla Silva talks about racism without racist and colorblind racism. And then I think something like technology right now is starting to facilitate, can facilitate this genre, something that seems to be neutral, not race-based, but based on some input or some data. Um, is going to have detrimental effects, and, and the problem with it is that you don't have a clear villain to identify to address. And I, I'll just say something that even beyond the criminal justice system, data in general about who owns it, this is the next frontier of the battle. Who owns it and what purpose will it be used for? This is going to be, I think, something that's going to be on the forefront. Uh, academics, traditionally, the, the narrative with regards to uh, genetics explaining inequality, with big data, as we start collecting biological markers and things like that, we don't even know what the markers mean, but people will find correlations that will be attached to various populations, and this will be the next smoking gun, but it'll be a smoking gun without any substance that will lack theory or lack any ability to ascribe to. But we all should be aware of this and, and be concerned about addressing it. Okay. Yeah, in the very front. That's you. 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 Oh. Uh. <laughs> she was looking. Thank you all. Um, my question is for you, Nicole. So you highlighted the failure of schools based on segregation or segregated schools and the chronic failure that exists in majority black schools and propose, I believe, integrated schools as the solution. And I'd love for you to talk about or just sort of unpack the attributes of integration that you think will address the chronic failure. So maybe you could use this as a way to respond, which is if we had better distribution of resources amongst majority black schools, like including quality teachers, financial resources, et cetera, is segregated or segregated schools still bad? and we still need integration or, so I just want you to kind of unpack the integration versus segregation argument. Sure. <clears throat> so a couple of things. Um, my argument for integration is, is based one on the data that shows, um, if you're looking at the racial achievement gap, the only thing that's worked on scale to close the racial achievement gap is integration. The reason for that is, um, is we have never given even equal resources to black schools anywhere in this country at any period in time. So we don't actually know what that looks like. So possibly. Um, the problem is the segregation that black children are facing today is a double segregation. 
pre-Brown v. Board of Education, schools may be racially uh, segregated, but they were economically integrated. You had all different classes of black people in those schools. Um, what integration has wrought is that middle class black people are often the ones who are in integrated schools. And what's left behind are schools that are not only entirely black, but also entirely poor. Mm -hmm. The same reason that we understand that ghettoizing neighborhoods is bad, that um, when you have entire communities that are struggling, that that is bad living environment, it creates also a toxic environment in the classroom. So I don't think that there are enough resources that you could scale up by concentr a concentrated uh, poverty school and a racially isolated school that would get you the proper results. But the second argument is that segregated schools are undemocratic. We live in a country that is majority white. We know who are the people who are holding power in this country. When you are segregating black students away from that, you are segregating them from power. You are segregating them from access to the people who are going to be able to write them college admissions letters, who are going to be able to get them an internship uh, from the elected officials who are going to um, be able to get them resources for their communities. Um, a great example of that, my daughter's school, which is a high poverty segregated school, um, was there was a rezoning for 50 white kids who were being asked to come to my daughter's school. 50 white kids in a system of a million students were able to draw to weekly meetings city elected officials, state elected officials, uh, the comptroller, that doesn't happen when you have black kids segregated in, in high poverty schools. I don't know what our parents could do that could draw that type of uh, resources. So that's the problem. Um, we understand that we are, if you ask why integration, you have to ask why segregation. Why did we choose to segregate black students in the first place? It was to demean them. It was to um, solidify their status as, as second class citizens. It was a way of girding ca a caste system. And it was a way of hoarding resources for white students. That is the way that the system continues to operate. So sure, um, it would be great if we could produce all black schools that we were giving the same resources to, but 400 years of history shows that we aren't going to do that. But even if we did that, we are still separating them from access to power in this country. And I think that's undemocratic. The person, oh, you, you, real, real, real yeah. quick, no, nothing is gonna, I'm gonna say is gonna contradict Nicole, what, what she just said, but integration into hostility can be, is problematic as well. We know that there are segregated schools with, from within where you have the high achievement classes uh, predominantly white and all the black students are in the low achievement classes and that's by design. And that, that's part of a structure that, that is able to maintain that, that the hoarding of resources within. So we, we certainly need to be cognizant of that. But I would argue when I'm saying integration, I mean integration, right? I mean, segregation within an integrated school is not integration. Yeah, right. and if you are a black parent, there will be a struggle. There will be a struggle. The struggle is, do I put my child in an all black learning environment where culturally it is good for my child, but academically my child may suffer? Or do I put my child in a white learning environment where academically my child will get everything, but socially and culturally it will be a challenge? We're black in this country. There, there's not going to be a choice that will not have some struggle. But we should not then give up on integration and not force integration to be done equitably because integration is a challenge. I wanted to, if I could just add one thing to the point about resource hoarding, I think it's a really critical point that yes. we've got to be very thoughtful about. And it is a real phenomenon that affects people over the course of the life cycle. Mm -hmm. um, that resource hoarding that Nicole and Derek were talking about, I mean, has everything, or at least a large part, to do with why the unemployment rate for every level of education is almost twice what it is for white people in the United States, black people, generally speaking, have an unemployment rate that is two times that of white people. Mm -hmm. And fundamentally, most people are getting their jobs by way of sometimes, you know, just simple word of mouth, or I heard there is a job, recommendations, as Nicole mentioned, sort of letters, putting you on a path, the general way that your familiarity, your shared school history and love affair with the same football teams, et cetera, can help in a job interview. These things really start to stack up over your life and it is important to be thoughtful about how important it is to distribute those things across the entire population. And you will have the last word. 
thank you. Uh, my question is primarily for Kristen. Um, so just finished, I just finished reading uh, Ari Barma's book, Give Us the Ballot, which is probably the most infuriating thing I've ever read. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious just your thoughts, particularly on like the insidiousness of the voter ID issue. Um, you know, luckily there's been like paper trail, so we've been able to strike it down in the courts. But to the lay person, um, on its surface, it's like, okay, I, I got an ID. Like, why does this, why, what's the big deal? Mm -hmm. I, I'm curious on what you all are doing and what, what are some strategies around um, kind of elevating this issue in the public consciousness such that uh, people see it for what it is. Yeah, I, I appreciate that question because it is one of the most uh, pernicious and dirty tactics used to suppress the right to vote that sounds really innocuous, right? How many of you all have photo ID? Right? This is not who we're talking about. These laws are about disenfranchising the poorest of the poor. Um, people who, you know, function, you know, the elderly, people who are born at home, you know, at home to midwives and they don't have a birth certificate and they don't have that document that you need to bring down to the local agency to get a passport. Um, we're talking about people who've never been on a plane, people who rely on public transportation. When we looked in Texas, when they put this law in the books, there were 600,000 people across the state who did not have a qualifying form of ID. And when we looked at that 600,000, we found that a disproportionate number of them were poor, black, and Latino. And there were a lot of elderly and students impacted as well. And these, the, uh, our elections are closely uh, contested, right? The margins sometimes are, are, are razor thin. And so when you put laws like this on the books, you nick just enough at the margins mm -hmm. that it starts to make a difference. It's not enough that you know 95% of us can overcome the hurdle. If there is a rule that locks out four, five percent of eligible Americans from the ballot box, then um, that's a shame, and that's something we have to fight, and that's a threat to democracy. And so that's why we're fighting in Texas, and that's why we're fighting all of these states where we're seeing these ugly voter suppression tactics rear their ugly head. And, and I would just add that a lot of times these, these laws are passed as voter identification, but baked in there or sort of hidden in, the, in some of the text is, well, we're also gonna close, you know, reduce early <laughs> registration. We're also gonna close some polling centers. Know. We're also gonna take all these other measures that have nothing to do with identification, but are rolled into a voter ID law. Mm -hmm. So then you have people that buy the bumper sticker ID is a good thing to have for voting, but what they get with, with that support are all these other measures that um, really undermine the, the sort of democracy we're trying to promote by putting these other measures uh, you know, baked into the law. Also, just quickly, it's also the type of ID, right? So That's right, right. You can't use a college ID, That's right. or you can't use your, social, or your uh, Medicaid card, right. but you can use a fishing or hunting license, right? Like they're right. picking particular license. IDs to right. weed out particular types of people. Absolutely. This is a really important point that actually goes to something else you mentioned, Kristen, which is the fact that historically, felon disenfranchisement laws were absolutely crafted to specifically remove people from uh, the voting, from the electorate. Um, when these laws were passed, legislatures, legislators had conversations on the record, on the House floor, on the Senate floor, discussing which crimes people of color versus white people commit, and therefore which crimes should be disqualifiers for future voting. And it is important to recognize that that's exactly what Nicole has just described with regard to the types of um, identification that are and are not ex um, accepted for voting. Well, I want to first of all thank our panel for their incredible work, um, both in this conversation and out in the world to make a difference.